Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Is cheating more expensive than the future? Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy it! It was Friday afternoon and two hours had passed since they left New York. They still had one more hour of driving before they reached their home. They accompanied their only child, Lisa, to her campus. She started studying in college. Nancy turned and looked at her husband, Bill, who was sitting behind the wheel of his Ford Transit. They couldn't take her BMW 230i convertible because they had to move Lisa's belongings. Time flies quickly, she thought. It was on the day she graduated from high school that she took a pregnancy test, and it came back positive. Bill was still at university studying to become an engineer. Their parents cooperated because they knew each other, and they also knew that their children were in love. She stayed with her parents after the baby was born, and they married after Bill graduated. A homemaker, she saw her husband start out as a junior engineer at a local factory, and then, ten years later, own his own air conditioning business. Since then, business has flourished. Bill entered into contracts with huge construction companies. He was always a hard-working guy who dedicated his life to his work and his family. The house will be empty without her, Bill said in a sad voice. She was closer to you than to me. She was always daddy's little girl. She is our princess and should be treated as such, Bill said. But have you seen her behavior in the last few months? She asked. She treated me like trash whenever you were at home. She was always by your side. Sometimes she laughed at me when you weren't there. She locked herself in a room avoiding me. Come on, Nancy, she's still a child. She was under a lot of pressure during her senior year of high school. She wanted to get the highest grades to fulfill her dream of attending Columbia University. At least try to understand, Bill said. I know, Bill, but did you see her reaction every time we were in the same room? Do you remember how, two months ago, I was sitting on the couch and she came up behind me with a knife? I thought she would harm me. That day, I saw hatred in her eyes, she said. It's your imagination, Nancy, Bill said, annoyed. Nancy was silent. She did not want to continue the conversation. She didn't want Bill to get angry, at least not now. She took out her mobile phone and sent a text message. We will be there in 30 minutes, she said. A minute later, her phone beeped. Is this from Lisa? Bill asked. No, this is Betty. And how does she get along with Paul? Last time at our barbecue party, she was ranting about how he works late and she spends too much time and cares about him more than he cares about her. She should know that the sheriff's job is not that easy. She should have thought carefully before marrying him, she said. Nancy remained silent again. She wanted Bill to remain calm until they got home. She just leaned against the window and prayed that they would be home quickly. As Bill pulled into the driveway, he saw the sheriff's car in front of his garage. Bill parked his van behind the car. Paul and his assistant came out and greeted Bill. What's happening, Bill? Paul asked in confusion. At the same time, Nancy ran back and stood behind Paul's assistant. Bill frowned. This is the worst part of my job that I hate doing, the sheriff said. He took out a thick paper envelope and handed it to Bill. William Thompson, you have been served. Paul, is this a joke? Bill took the envelope with a trembling hand. He turned to Nancy. She lowered her eyes because she could not look her husband in the face. Why, Nancy? What have I done, Bill? It will be better if you leave, contact a lawyer, and take care of your divorce. There is also a restraining order. You are not allowed to come here or be within 500 feet of Nancy, said Paul. Paul, last Sunday, you were here with Betty at Lisa's barbecue party. You both knew what would happen. You came to my house, you ate my food, you even wished Lisa good luck in her studies and her future. You both left with smiles on your faces. This is what I call hypocrisy, Bill said. Bill, try to understand, Paul said. Why are you an idiot? Bill yelled. And you stuck a knife in my back. He turned to Nancy with angry eyes. If you didn't love or want me anymore, you should have told me. I would divorce you amicably. The restraining order has already entered into force. 
I advise you to leave this place, Paul said. Bill walked to his van and tossed the envelope onto the passenger seat. Then, he slammed the door and walked over to Paul. I need my personal belongings. I hope you are not such an that you will refuse me to enter my house and take some of my personal belongings, Paul interrupted. He took out the house key and headed to the front door. Your key won't work. Paul took a set of keys from his pocket and handed them to his assistant. I see that you took care of everything. Or is it Betty? She was supposed to be here today with the mechanic while we were gone, am I right? Paul didn't answer, he simply nodded to his assistant. The latter escorted Bill into the house and remained next to him while he filled two suitcases. Don't worry, Paul told Nancy. My guys will be patrolling here regularly. If I were you, I wouldn't leave the house for several days. He is extremely angry and can do anything in anger. I'll stay at home. I'll call a friend to come and spend the weekend at the house, Nancy answered. Yes, friend, Paul muttered. Bill came out with the suitcases and put them in the back of the van. The assistant handed Nancy a set of keys. Bill took the envelope, took out the divorce document, and began to read it. Bill, you've packed your things and it's time for you to leave, Paul ordered. Wait, this wants 50% of my business, 50% of all our savings. She wants a house and her own car, plus monthly child support. This is taking me to the cleaners. Bill, if you don't leave... I'll have to arrest you, Paul tried to remove a pair of handcuffs from his belt. No need, Paul. I'll sign the papers right now and disappear, Bill took a pen and signed wherever it was indicated with small stickers with arrows. Could you please certify the document and give me my copy? Nancy, Paul, and his assistant stood in shock. They would never have believed that Bill would accept these terms. Nancy smiled and thought how lucky she was. She got everything she wanted and was free from her husband and daughter. Paul signed the papers as a witness and handed Bill a copy. Bill headed to his van. Who is he? How long have you been cheating on me with him? Bill attacked Nancy. Go inside and lock the door behind you, Paul told Nancy and headed towards Bill's van. The assistant escorted her inside. Don't do anything stupid. Think about Lisa. I already did something stupid when I married that, Bill shouted and started the engine. She chose to divorce me because she knew that I would never agree to an open marriage. How are you, what is an open marriage? Asked a stunned Paul. Don't try to hide it, Paul. Everyone knows this. What are you talking about? Paul almost screamed. Look, Paul, we all know that when you work at night, your brother Tom warms your bed, which of course completely by chance, is your wife. You're turning me against my brother. Oh, your wife is cheating on you. Considering that you scum betrayed me, I don't apologize for bringing you bad news. Well, I see you're already used to dealing with it, so even though you're the sheriff, you can't tell when someone is lying. Go home and ask Betty, then you will know. Bye, cuckled, Bill turned around and left his former property as he was told. Once alone, Nancy poured herself a glass of wine and stood in front of Paniel's masterpiece, the railway station. The painting was worth 100,000 or more. He left his loss here, she thought with an evil smile. She picked up the phone and pressed the speed dial button. Come on, Jason, pick up the phone. Nancy shouted into her phone after the connection failed, then she hung up the phone thoughtfully. He should have come right here after work, she told herself. She sat down and took a sip of wine. She remembered how they first met. It was a year ago, she was in a department store when they ran into each other. He was in charge of the shoe section. He was in his early twenties and had a perfect body. She melted on the spot. They exchanged phone numbers. The next day, she called him and invited him to her home. He came during lunch break and ravished her like a stallion. After he left, she felt violated, barely able to walk. That evening, she told Bill she wasn't feeling well and went to bed early. After that day, she realized that Bill could never compare to her younger, energetic lover. Bill was always busy with his own affairs. At night, he always felt tired. He helped Lisa with her homework and then stayed up late looking at his files. As soon as he climbed into bed, he immediately fell asleep. 
Nancy finished her wine and poured herself another glass. She pressed the speed dial button again and received an automated voice message. The number you are calling is temporarily unavailable. Please try again later. Angrily, she threw the phone on the sofa, grabbed the remote control, and turned on the TV. She couldn't concentrate on the screen, so she decided to take a shower. It was a week ago when she was taking a shower with Jason, and he took her to the spot where she was sitting. This was something she had always denied her husband, and Jason made it clear her fifth place belonged to him and him alone. The last time she was at his house, he nearly beat her half to death. She had a spare key and could visit her lover at any time. Sometimes she would come there when he was at work and clean the entire apartment. She bought him clothes, shoes, cologne, and gave him an expensive watch for his birthday. She gave him a decent amount of pocket money from time to time, and sometimes she let him drive her BMW. She didn't care. She had her young lover, a real man who could satisfy her. Now they would be together, and they wouldn't need to be afraid of anyone. She was free, and he would move in with her. That evening, after her shower, she came into the living room, grabbed her cell phone, and shouted, Where are you, Jason? Why don't you pick up the damn phone? She went to the kitchen and prepared herself a light dinner. Damn, I can't leave the house, otherwise, I would go to his house. Then something caught her attention on the TV screen. She rushed into the living room and turned up the volume. She watched in horror as Sheriff Paul Anderson was led to a police car in handcuffs. Sheriff Paul Anderson first shot his wife in the head, then he drove to his brother's workplace and shot him five times. Both his wife and brother are dead, said the presenter. Nancy turned off the TV and sat down, shocked. Oh Betty, I told you to be very careful. She remembered that it was Bill who told Paul about his wife's infidelity, and she began to cry, realizing that it was her actions that led to the death of her best friend and her lover. Although Paul helped her so much in the destruction of her husband, she did not particularly care about his fate. That night, she couldn't sleep at all. For the first time, she felt completely alone. She had kicked out her husband, her lover could not be contacted, her best friend was killed, her daughter avoided her and her parents had already left this world. Only her sister remained, but she lived with her husband Tom in another city, 300 miles away. Saturday passed, and she still couldn't reach Jason. She was alarmed and annoyed at the same time. He could at least leave a message and let me know what's going on, Nancy thought over and over again. On Sunday morning, she decided to go to Jason's apartment. As soon as she walked inside, she felt something was wrong. Photos on the wall and all electronic items were missing, his closet was empty, and there was no sign of any of his personal belongings. In the bathroom, she threw herself on the bed. He left. He left me without saying a word, Nancy exclaimed. How could he do this to me? It was his idea to divorce Bill so that he could move in with me, and we could get married after the divorce was final. She left the apartment and went to a department store that was open on Sundays. There she hoped to find Jason at work. She knew one of his colleagues. She was told that Jason, half an hour after arriving at work on Friday morning, asked to go back to his room because he had forgotten his wallet. He didn't return, and later that day emailed his boss a letter of resignation. Broken, Nancy walked to her car. Why? Why did he do this to me? She thought in confusion. She began to cry. On her way home, she stopped at a gas station and was shocked to discover that her credit and debit cards weren't working. She cursed when she had to pay with all the cash she had in her purse. At home, she drowned her sorrows in alcohol. On Monday morning, she walked into the bank and met with the manager. She was stunned when she learned that her joint account with her husband contained less than $5. Mrs. Thompson, last Friday, your husband came to the bank and closed your joint credit card. He also reminded us that you are divorcing him and he will no longer be responsible for the mortgage on the house and your car. This is a mistake. My car was paid off in full and the mortgage on my house should have been paid off by now, said an astonished Nancy. No, the bank issued a loan for your car. We have all the supporting papers. Mrs. Thompson, your husband also took out a second mortgage on the house to pay for your daughter's schooling and expenses. But why is there no money in my account? asked Nancy. 
Last week, your monthly mortgage payment was debited from your account. There have been no deposits in the last three months. Whatever money there was, it was exhausted. What about my husband's business? A monthly transfer from the company account is expected. Unfortunately, Mrs. Thompson, I cannot tell you the details of Mr. Thompson's account. But what I can say is that if your upcoming mortgage payments are not made, your house and your car will be repossessed. But I don't work. I've been a housewife my whole life. I think it would be best for you to discuss these issues with your lawyer. She then checked the safe she shared with her husband. There was only her jewelry. She took them all and put them in her purse. As soon as she left the bank, she called Bill on his cell phone. She received an email voicemail that the number was no longer in service. Puzzled, she called Bill at work. The phone on the other end continued to ring without an answer. She swore, then she quickly dialed Lisa's number. What do you want? Lisa shouted angrily over the phone. Is this how you talk to your mother? Lisa answered the amazed Nancy. How do you want me to talk to you? I just want to talk to your father, Nancy muttered. I can't reach him by phone. Do you know where he is or how I can contact him? I know, but I won't tell you. The way you callously abandon him makes you the worst on this earth. I don't want anything to do with you. I no longer consider myself your daughter. I don't want you to call me again. I'd better change my number, the phone went off. Shocked, Nancy got into her car, holding the steering wheel. She looked into the distance, and her thoughts were somewhere far away. She tried to figure out where she had gone wrong in her plan and why Jason had left without saying a word. She called her lawyer and managed to get an appointment later that afternoon. Nancy's lawyer told her, Mrs. Thompson, after your morning phone call, we did some research about your husband's company. Last Thursday, he filed for bankruptcy. Before you served him, the company will most likely be liquidated. But last time you said that I could get millions, Nancy almost screamed. Please calm down, Mrs. Thompson. Two weeks ago, there were no signs of any financial difficulties. Everything was in your favor. The company's bank account is now frozen. What about a car and a mortgage on a house? Last week, he used your house as collateral for a loan, again before filing divorce papers, and for a car, when you signed the title. You also signed the loan in your name. All this cannot be true, Nancy began to cry. Mrs. Thompson, I have a personal question for you. Do you think your husband knew he was going to be served? No, Nancy answered, looking very thoughtful. He never saw this coming. She took a deep breath. So, as far as I'm concerned, I won't get a penny from my husband's company. I have no money in the bank, and my car and house will be repossessed? I'm afraid so, yes. Is there any way to get him to at least pay the mortgage? The company was his only income, without this, he is ruined. Once he starts working, we can force him to pay you child support. We had several investment certificates that I could not find in our safe deposit box. We can find out when he cashed these certificates and also conduct a thorough investigation into his company. And we will have to look for your husband. We don't know where he is. His legal advisor handles everything. Please find him. One question, Mrs. Thompson, all this will require additional expenses. How will you pay the bill? Nancy had never thought about all these expenses, and then suddenly she smiled. I have a painting that costs a lot of money. Fine, take the money and write us a check so we can get to work. No problem. I'll call you soon. And one last thing, Mrs. Thompson, I think you should prepare to vacate your home. I advise you to start looking for a place to stay. At home, she sat in front of a painting by Pignal. I sincerely wanted to leave you, but because of this husband, we will have to separate, she turned to the painting. She then took out her cell phone and called her sister. Hey sis, I want to ask you for a favor. You know, Nancy, I never refused you anything. Bill and I are getting a divorce. Is this some kind of joke? No, sister, it's difficult. I will need a place to stay temporarily. I was wondering if you would be so kind as to let me stay in your guest room. I'll explain everything when we meet. What about Lisa? How did she take it? You know that she is her father's daughter. I'm the bad guy here. 
Is there any way you both can work this out, for example, go to a consultant? I don't think so. I'm really sorry. There's no problem with me. I don't think Tom will say no, and our daughter will be happy for you to stay with us for a while. Thank you, sister. I'll let you know when I arrive. Nancy hung up. On Tuesday, Nancy went to the jeweler to have her jewelry appraised. To her great surprise, she was told that all her jewelry was made of gilded copper and was cheap. She cursed Bill for giving her fake gifts. She then rushed to a fine art gallery where she met an appraiser. I would like to know how much my Paniel train station costs, asked Nancy. The man took the painting and carefully examined every square inch. Railway station is Paniel's best work. He managed to put all the emotions into one work. There is an arrival, a departure, happiness, and sadness glued together. He carefully placed the painting on the easel and directed the lamp light onto it. He took a magnifying glass and began to examine. After a couple of minutes, he started laughing. Is there something wrong? asked Nancy, puzzled. Wait, I'll show you something. The man brought his laptop, placed it on the table next to his easel, and opened a website. He pressed a few keys, and an image of this painting appeared on the screen. He zoomed in on the bottom left corner. You see here on the platform, there is a man and a little girl watching a woman walking towards the train, her back to them. The man looks very sad, and the girl is crying. I see it. So what? Nancy was a little confused. Now, look at the same scene in your painting, the man handed Nancy a magnifying glass. Nancy took a quick glance at the lower left corner and nearly fainted. In your painting, both the man and the little girl are laughing and showing the middle finger to the woman, as if they are mocking her. So this is it? It's fake, muttered Nancy. Yes, I'm very sorry, but good, oh my god. Nancy pulled out a chair and sat down hopelessly. I can offer you $200. I just want to hang it up so my friends and clients can have a good laugh. Nancy made the deal and left like a broken woman. Her phone rang, and she found out her sister's number. Hi, little sister, Nancy said, trying to hide her grief. Don't call me sis, her sister's angry voice shouted at her. What? Why? Tom received an email from an unknown person, also sent to all our relatives and mutual friends. There is a link to an adult website. There are tons of videos of you having intim with your boyfriend, all dated from last year to last week. How could you, Nancy? You had a night with someone in your marital bed, and some of the scenes take place in a cheap hotel room, her sister's voice screamed. I need to explain. You don't need to explain anything to me. You're disgusting. Tom doesn't want you around his family. He said that you will defile me and my daughter. Our doors are closed to you. Go to your lover. The phone went off. Oh my god. He knew, he knew from the very beginning. Nancy had a terrible look on her face. What should I do now? She felt dizzy. Everyone knows, the whole city knows. I have to leave here, run away, run away. Five years later, Bill was sitting in the front row at church. He thought about the phone call he received that morning. He didn't tell anyone about this. How could he do this on such a significant day? He had just walked Lisa down the aisle. He looked at the couple at the altar. Lisa said yes to her boyfriend, the guy she had been dating since her freshman year of college. His thoughts returned to the day when a crying Lisa called him. He remembered that he was in his office when his princess called. Daddy, Daddy, please come home, Lisa cried. What's going on, honey? Why are you crying? asked a stunned Bill. Please, Dad, go now. I'm waiting on the street in front of our house, in front of the house. What's wrong? I'll call your mom. No, don't call her, just come, please, Dad, Lisa begged. I'm on my way, honey. On the way to his house, Bill began to worry. A variety of thoughts raced through his head. Why wasn't his daughter at school? Why was she outside the house and not inside? Why didn't she want him to warn Nancy? Was she injured? Suddenly, he slammed on the brakes with a roar of tires. He was about to run a red light. Keep calm, he told himself. 
He knew that Lisa had been working on the project until late the evening before. He even helped her and gave her some ideas. Together, they put everything into a PowerPoint file and saved it to a USB drive. Lisa was waiting one block down the street. Bill stopped the car, and she jumped inside. Please don't go into the house, Dad, okay? Lisa said. Tell me what's going on. Bill turned off the engine. I forgot my USB drive this morning when I was rushing to school. I received special permission to come home during lunch to pick him up. I saw an old Honda in our driveway. I entered the house and heard strange sounds coming from your and your mother's bedroom. I quietly walked up the stairs and looked into the bedroom. The door was not completely closed. Lisa, begin to cry. Okay, honey, breathe, Bill said in a soothing voice. He stroked her back. Do not rush. I saw a man. They were both without clothes. They had intimate dad. She's cheating on you on us. Lisa sobbed again. Bill sat in shock. He realized that his 17-year-old daughter knew what cheating. Are you sure about what you saw? He turned to face her. I recorded this on my phone, she said, taking out her cell phone and turning it on for her father. Bill's world suddenly stopped when he heard Nancy make a sound. Get her out of the house, Dad. I don't want to see her anymore. She's not my mom. My mother would never do such things. I'll have to think about it. What do you need to think about? Just throw her out. It's not that simple, honey. There are legal procedures to follow. Tell me, Dad, do you still want to stay with her? Do you still want to sleep with her? I don't condone cheating, but we need to know why she did it whether it was a one-time affair or she did it for a long time, or whether she will continue it. Here he is, Lisa pointed at the Honda pulling out of the driveway and turned away from them. Let's follow the guy, Bill started the engine. They followed the Honda into the store. They found a guy putting on a uniform jacket as he left his car in the parking lot and headed towards the employee entrance. He works here. He's still young, said Bill. Young or not, I don't care, Lisa answered, taking several pictures of the guy in his car. We already know what's happening, so honey, I'll give you a ride to school. I'll go home, pick up your flash drive, and bring it to you. I'll tell your mom. She is not my mother. Lisa shouted to her father. I'll tell Nancy that you called me and asked me to bring it to you. I don't want you to meet her alone. Not now, not at any other time. You understand? I understand, but why? For the simple reason that I don't want her to know that we know. I don't want you to spill the beans out of anger. What are you going to do? I want to know everything you do. I want you to keep me updated. Do you promise? Yes, princess. I promise to keep you posted. I love you, dad, Lisa hugged Bill. I love you too. Now. Take me to school and quickly bring me the USB since my lesson will start soon. Bill parked in the driveway and walked into the house. Darling, I'm home. Nancy ran out of the bedroom with shock on her face. Oh, Bill, it's you. Who would you like it to be? He looked Nancy straight in the eyes. I didn't expect you at this hour. Lisa called. She forgot her flash drive. I need to bring it to her. He walked up to Nancy and smelled intimate coming from her. Do we have time for quick intim? No, the thing is that I was a little tired from cleaning the house and was very sweaty. You won't like it, and you need to bring Lisa her USB drive. You're right. At work, Bill scoured the internet for the best video and audio surveillance device, as well as cell phone spy software. Later, he went to an electronics store and bought everything he needed. He made one main decision, from this day forward, he will never touch his wife. As promised, he will share everything with Lisa. Over the next three months, he learned a lot. He knew everything about Nancy's lover, Jason White. Jason came to their house almost every day, either in the morning when he worked the second shift or during lunch. On weekends when Nancy had to go shopping, she would stop by his house if he was not working. She also had a spare key. Bill found out that she buys a lot of things for Jason. He also listened to a conversation between Nancy and her best friend, Betty, in which they shared all their secrets. That's how he found out that Betty is engaged in having intimate with my brother-in-law. 
One Saturday, Bill rummaged through Nancy's purse and found a key hidden at the bottom. He quickly drove to the mall and removed the duplicate key. The following week, he visited Jason's apartment. It was an old building in a notorious part of town. The place was so cheap that there were no security cameras, and the main entrance to the building wasn't even locked. He placed several tiny hidden spy cameras in the apartment, controlled by small, long-life lithium button cells. He also searched everywhere and found all the expensive things that Nancy had bought. Bill began to develop a plan to get out of this relationship, both with maximum damage to both Nancy and her lover. He asked a jeweler to make copies of all of Nancy's jewelry, which were to be made of gilded copper. He then ordered a fake painting of Peniel's railway station, painted by a professional with special instructions. He met a childhood friend, Steve, who was a corporate lawyer. When he explained his plan, the lawyer scheduled a meeting for a couple of days later. That day, Steve introduced him to his cousin, Linda, who was an auditor and an expert in her field. Bill was honest and straightforward with them. He wanted to legally seize his company and then control it from a distance. In a couple of years, he will ask his daughter, Lisa, to buy out the company. He often met with Linda, either in her office or they had lunch together. She was a widow, her husband died in a car accident. She had a 10-year-old son and had not dated anyone since her husband's death. Gradually, a friendship arose between them. One day, he invited her to dinner and then to a movie. She agreed. That same evening, Lisa went to spend the night with her friend, and Bill pretended to work late. Bill pulled into Linda's driveway. Thank you for accepting the invitation, he said to Linda. This is my first date since my husband died. I understand. And I hope you liked it. Yes. Can we do this again sometime when you're free? We have to work together, and you're still married. She leaned over and kissed Bill on the cheek. Let's do one thing at a time. She opened the car door and walked towards her house. Bill advised Nancy to change her car. She was a little reluctant because she liked her Lexus. When he told her that driving a BMW convertible would make her look younger, she readily agreed. The Lexus was fully paid for, so Bill sold it and cashed out. He took out a car loan for a BMW and put it in Nancy's name. When she signed the document, she thought it was for a certificate of ownership. In between documents, she signed other papers that would come back to bite her later. A couple of weeks later, Bill noticed that when Nancy goes to the bathroom after a good night, Jason leaves the bedroom without clothes and goes to Lisa's room. He drew Lisa's attention to this, and she became extremely furious. They decided to install a camera in her room. What they found was alarming. Jason opened the drawer, took Lisa's underwear, and stroked his manhood with it. That afternoon, while Nancy was sitting on the couch, Lisa approached her from behind with a knife. If Bill had not intervened at this point, Lisa would have heard hurt or even killed Nancy. Later in the evening, Lisa told her father that she would not have gone to jail if she had killed Nancy because she was still a minor. Bill wasn't surprised when he heard Jason urging Nancy to divorce him and send him to the cleaners. But one thing the lovers didn't know was that he was already one step ahead. He knew that Nancy often let Jason drive the BMW and even let him have a night with her in the back seat. He knew when Nancy went to see the divorce lawyer Paul suggested, and he also knew that the lawyer had done some research into his company and all of his assets. He waited a couple of days and took out a second mortgage on his house to pay for Lisa's full tuition. The next day, he declared himself bankrupt. He knew that the day he was served, Betty would change the locks on his house. When they were in New York during a barbecue party the weekend before Lisa left, both father and daughter played their part. Paul and Betty were as friendly as ever. Paul even helped cook some meat on the grill. No one would have thought that they were traitors. That Friday morning, while Nancy was in the bathroom, Bill took her cell phone and sent Jason a text message. I'm coming to your house at 8, and I want you to have a night with me before I go with them for the last time. Get permission from work and hurry home. It will always be yours. I'll tell them that I need to buy a few things. Don't call or text me. I'll leave my cell phone at home in case they call me and ask where I am. See you soon, my future husband. Bill deleted the message after sending it and put the phone back in Nancy's purse. What Jason didn't know was that as soon as he walked into his apartment, 
Three men would pounce on him and beat him up with a knife to his throat. They forced him to send a resignation email to his manager. Then there would be another email to the building owner saying he would be leaving at the end of the month. They would then pill him with tranquilizers, clean out his apartment, remove the spy cameras, and take whatever they could carry, pretending he's gone forever. They would wrap his body in a carpet, put him in a van, and drive away. One of the people would drive his car. Jason would never be seen again. Neither Lisa nor Linda would have known what Bill did to Jason. This would be his secret, which he would take with him to the grave. On Friday afternoon, after being served, Bill checked into a motel room. He laughed as he watched the evening news about Paul and his adulterous wife before dinner. One of the men who was in Jason's apartment visited him. He gave Bill all the cameras and received the final payment. Not a word was spoken. He didn't even tell Bill where Jason's body was buried. On Saturday morning, Bill left the motel, bought a new cell phone, and threw away his old one. He called Lisa and gave her his new number. He drove to Linda's house. There, he spent all his time editing videos. He blurred out Jason's face because he didn't want the police to make a connection between the two lovers if Jason were ever reported missing. He stayed in the guest room and at the same time became friends with Linda's son. Bill and Linda began the final phase of their plan. When an elderly couple from Seattle bought his company, the couple were actually Linda's aunt and uncle. Not a single employee was fired. On Monday, Lisa called him and said that Nancy was looking for him. They both laughed. He later uploaded all the videos to an adult website using a fake email address. He sent a link to all the people they knew, including Nancy's brother-in-law. He continued to stay with Linda for the next three months until his divorce case was heard. They continued to date but without any bed contact. Linda made it clear that Bill would only touch her when he was single and not before. Bill agreed because he wanted to keep his vows for the rest of the mark. One of the advantages of staying with Linda was that if there was any investigation, Bill would say that he was penniless and couldn't afford to pay rent. And that his friend Linda was kind enough to let him take over her guest room until he was back on his feet. On the day of the hearing, Nancy was absent from court. Since Nancy's house and car had already been repossessed and Bill was broke and unemployed, the judge granted the divorce without alimony or division of property. Nancy's lawyer did not object. Later in the corridor, they ran into each other. You are a very smart man, Mr. Thompson, said the lawyer. Really? Bill frowned and walked away. Dad, wake up, his daughter's voice brought him back to the present. Yes, honey, what were you talking about? This is the dance of the father of the bride, everyone is looking at us but you don't move at all. Sorry, princess. I was thinking about something else. Bill took his daughter's hand, turned her around, and they both began to move to the beat of the music. Now, I need to dance with your mother, Bill said to Lisa when the song ended. And I promised my younger brother that he would be third on the list. Lisa smiled. Bill approached Linda and invited her to the dance floor. Later, Bill walked up to the bar and ordered whiskey. He sat down, and his thoughts went back to the phone call he had received that morning at home, in his bedroom. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. I am Dr. Henry Dusa from Dallas, Texas. This concerns your wife. What's wrong with my wife? Bill asked, confused. She's in the next room now, I mean, Nancy Thompson. Bill hadn't heard that name in five years. He threw himself on the bed. I'm listening, doctor. I am a psychologist, and I am treating my patient, Nancy Thompson, in her last days. Her last days? Yes, Mr. Thompson. Do you have a few minutes to let me briefly explain the situation? Yes, go ahead, said a confused Bill. Your wife, I mean, your ex-wife, told me about her life from the time she was a little girl until we met. She said that you were the only man she knew until she met a certain Jason and she made a huge mistake, which she realized later. She mentioned the divorce she was planning and the consequences. She is sure that you knew about this affair and set her up. She accepts her fate and the loss of her husband and daughter as much as she was the one who wronged you. The day she left town, she only had $200 in her pocket. She wanted to move as far away as possible because of what she had done and also because of the videotapes of her intimantics. 
she took the first bus that left and made it to Texas. She got a job as a waitress in a dingy, second-rate bar on Interstate 20 that was frequented mostly by truck drivers. The owner rented her a room on the first floor for a small fee, but in exchange, he had a night with her whenever he wanted. A year later, she was pregnant, and since she had no health insurance, she went to a cheap quack for an abortion. The guy performed an unsuccessful operation on her, damaging some of her organs. A year later, the owner began pimping her out to truckers. Some used protection, and some did not. When she was brought to the hospital, she had an acute vile disease and was already infected with AIDS. She has lost a lot of weight and knows she is dying. Her last wish is to see you before she dies. Doctor, I'm really sorry to hear this. My daughter is getting married today. I'll call you next week. Don't waste too much time, Mr. Thompson. I'll give you my direct line number. Hey, honey, don't drink too much. You'll have to take us home later. Linda hugged her husband and kissed him tenderly. You are the best thing that ever happened to me, darling. Bill pushed his glass away. I will never put you or our son in danger. Let's dance. A couple of days later, Bill called Dr. Dua from his office and informed him that due to his heavy workload, he would not be able to make the trip south. The doctor recommended that Bill at least talk to Nancy on the phone. He will transmit the call to the ward where she was. He had a cordless phone that the nurse would take to Nancy's bedside. Bill, is that you? Bill heard a weak voice from the past. Nancy, it's me. Oh, Bill, Nancy began to cry. I'm sorry, Bill. I really am sorry for what I did to you and our family. Now I'm paying for it. I forgave you, Nancy. I continued to live my life, and I'm happy. Bill took a deep breath. I have to thank you. After my divorce, I married the most wonderful woman in the world, and we had a son. Lisa absolutely loves her new mom, and they both get along very well. By the way, she got married last Saturday. It was a wonderful wedding ceremony. Her mother took care of everything. Lisa's children will no doubt call her grandmother. We are both waiting for this moment. Bill heard Nancy begin to sob, then he heard a loud, continuous, high-pitched sound of medical equipment and noise in Nancy's room. He waited, and finally heard a frightened voice. Mr. Thompson, I'm Nurse Angela Smith. Sorry, I'll have to hang up, and the phone went off. Bill looked at the family photo on his desk. He smiled. He who laughs last, laughs best, he said to himself. What do you think of our story today? It seems to me that the man is completely right in that without talking he started to formalize the divorce because if there was one time, there will be a second time. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. Until new videos.